In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name name of Jesus, Jesus, and by his blood, I put on the helmet of salvation. I put on the breastplate of his righteousness. I put on the girdle of truth. My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In my left hand I take the shield of faith, wherewith I may quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And in my right hand I take the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word, and I cut myself free from everything that is not of God's Spirit. I wash my mind in the blood of Jesus, and I march behind the barricade of the cross of Calvary, led by His Spirit and cleansed by His blood. Father, into Thy hands I commit my spirit, soul, and body. In the name of Jesus, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, this, um, this gospel is so rich um, that it's hard to um, pick one theme, so I didn't try to frustrate myself and try to pick one theme. I thought this would be one of those uh, Bible studies where we could actually do a uh, a quick like top ten. So this is going to be the Emmaus, the Emmaus top ten, and uh, and really it's just meant to be a, a really an overview of some of the really the Catholic faith. This would be a really good gospel to share with someone that doesn't understand the Catholic faith too much, or doesn't think that we're a Bible church. Um, I think the reason this gospel is so key one because it's gospel and it's a scripture. And someone that's uh, a Bible believer, you know, they could read this in their own uh, version of the Bible. It's right there. And then you could unpack for them. Uh, one of the things I, that I used to like, to, I, I, I did in college, but also in high school, is when someone would invite me to a Bible study. You know, it's very common. This probably happened to you that a Protestant might say, hey, we're starting a Bible study uh, in the afternoon in between this period and this period or whatever. You know, they would do that in high school and college. And yeah, well, what, what's it on? Oh, we just kind of pick a verse and, and talk about it. And so I'd be like, well, let's, let's do John 6, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. which, of course, is packed mm-hmm. with the Eucharist. Um, and they would always say, oh, I'm not I'm never really familiar with that one. Right. <laughs> so John 6, you, could, you could also do, well, let's do, uh, let's do Luke 24, you know. The reason this is important, one, it's in the gospel, like I said, but two, this is actually the day he rose from the dead. So it says there, it starts, that very day, the first day of the week. The first day of the week is what the, the gospel writers, the apostles, the first day of the week was Sunday, and it was also the resurrection. So it was on the first day of the week that they met for the breaking of the bread. So there are kind of some code words um, in the church one of those is the first day of the week always means Sunday and the resurrection. Every Sunday is a mini Easter, a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Um, breaking of the bread was code word for the Eucharist. Um, you know, Eucharist is Greek for Thanksgiving. All right, yeah. And so he, he took bread and he gave thanks, right? So the thanks in Eucharist. So let's just walk through some of the main things. I don't want to take too much time because, of course, it would go a long time with Tin here. But I just want to highlight a few things. The first is Jesus is our good shepherd. Um, next Sunday, uh, what's in two days, three days from now? Uh, sorry, two days from now uh, will be Good Shepherd Sunday. So um, that follows this, this gospel, actually, So um, at least in liturgical year. So what do we know about the good shepherd? What does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd, right? And, and I know my sheep, and mine know me. I know my sheep, the, mine know me. The hireling will flee, mm-hmm. but I'll never leave. I'll never leave you. I'll leave. Uh, I'll go for you, even if you're lost. Exactly. So um, I will never leave you. So one of the things that he's trying to show these disciples, remember, there there were about 120 disciples in the upper room at Pentecost. So you had the disciples, which were um, were a group of followers. They, were, they weren't as close to him as the apostles, but it, it kind of, in the ranking, you had Matthew, uh, I'm sorry, Peter, James, and John, which were the three that were like the inner circle with Jesus. 
From that, you had the apostles, which were the 12. So you had like three, and then 12, and then 120 yeah, disciples that were found. And then I think what the 77 were sent out. Anyways, whatever. So you did have these disciples. These were two of those disciples. And we see that the disciples here, yes, there's just two of them, but they kind of represent the attitude of the disciples. They were downcast. They, past tense, thought he would be the one. All past tense. They're disappointed. They've lost hope. They're downcast, and they're leaving town. They're walking away from the church. The church at this point is where? In the upper room. In the upper room in Jerusalem. The only church that's there is it's very loose and wounded right now, but his followers are still in Jerusalem. So in a, in a very true sense, these disciples have lost hope, they have lost faith, they're sad, and they're walking away from the church. Does that sound familiar? Mm-hmm. Yes. In every one of our lives, we, I think it's safe to say everyone in this room, knows someone in your family that has lost faith, that's downcast, that has lost hope, that what they wanted Jesus to be, or maybe what thought they thought Jesus or the church would be for them, has disappointed them. And that doesn't mean the church has disappointed them, but what they thought the church should be, or what they thought Christ should be. That's a big difference. Christ does not disappoint, if you really know him. He might challenge, you might not like him, but if you know who he is, it's not going to be disappointing. It might be aggravating, but not disappointing. Same thing goes for the church. So we, we know this is true. So Jesus shows us something amazing here. On the, on the, what is he doing that morning? In the morning, he's appearing to um, Mary. Mary Magdalene. He's at the tomb. And we don't know exactly the time frame, but we do know something about this. We know Emmaus is a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem. And we do know that these disciples and Jerusalem were in Jerusalem. And then that night, they're in Emmaus. So how long does it take to walk seven miles? It's a, maybe three hours if you don't if you don't have the greatest of roads. Okay. They didn't, and they left in the afternoon. Okay. It says in the gospel they left in the afternoon. I don't know if it's in this one, but so so they're let's just say they we know they arrive in the evening. In the evening, yes. Whatever. Let's just say three hours to be safe. But it, but if. Um, if I was walking with Jesus, I can't do two things at once. So I can't walk at a decent pace and keep on a good conversation. Um, I'd probably be walking slow or wanting to take a break. So it may take longer if Jesus was talking to me because I can't do two things at once. So three hours at least. So he spends, safe to say, from afternoon to evening with how many people? Two. Two, two people. <clears throat> Are there other people including his apostles that are really sad at this moment Mm -hmm. and really confused. So why does he do that? That should tell us a lot there. Why does he, he could do anything that day. He's Jesus. He's going after the lost sheep. He's he's going after the lost sheep. He's going after the, the one. The 99 are still in Jerusalem. He knows, he knows being God, he knows that they're sad, they're disappointed, but they're going to be okay. He, he knows that these two wandering off are not going to be okay. He has to intercede. He has to go. I think sometimes in the church we have to realize that there's going to be um, some of us at times that are found, that feel very close to, to the heart of Christ. Um, and we could get disappointed that our priest goes after the one. Why is he always talking to those people? <laughs> Why are they always doing programs for those people? It might be because we're trying to imitate the good shepherd. Now, does do all the sheep need to have care? Yes. Um, but we do see in this that Jesus, the good shepherd, is going to go after those lost. And, and we have to rejoice when we see our priests and our bishop and, um, and even ourselves going after the lost. Um, we have to really rejoice. Um, but sometimes we want that attention, too. Um, okay, so he does spend the majority of that day with the lost because he is the good shepherd. Will the church continue to do that? Yes, as the shepherd of soul, we'll see our bishops, our bishops uh, 
I think you see this uh, very often with Bishop Olson as, as you hear him speak. Uh, he's very concerned for the marginalized. He's very concerned for, for, the, for the people that might be getting lost or slipping through the cracks. And he wants to uh, make sure that they too are welcomed in the fold. And I think that you see that consistent through the church, the 2,000 years of the church. Um, and, and a lot of it is, of course, based on this gospel and the actions of Christ. Okay, the second, I think this is interesting. Why does God prevent us from seeing him at times? Ha, ha, and what I mean, Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, you know, that's what I mean by God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why, why is it that not, sometimes we are prevented from seeing the action of the Holy Spirit in our life? Why is it that we're prevented from seeing Christ in our life or presented, prevented from seeing the Father's presence in our life? How, why, why is that? Walk in faith. Walk in faith. Um, these disciples were prevented. It says prevented. Mm-hmm. And, and then we have to say, well, why, why would God do that? Um, Bishop Olson preached a homily on this gospel once, and he said, he, he asked us this question. If they would have known it was Jesus, would they have asked him to stay? Absolutely. There is no doubt. If they but think so so that's one side of this, and we'll get to that on the number six here. It's amazing that they don't know it's Jesus and they still ask him to stay. Right? So that's but but on the other side, if they were if they knew it was Jesus, would they have been as open and vulnerable? Probably not. <clears throat> they really were vulnerable because they thought this was... If they would have known it was Jesus, they probably would have fell down and said, please forgive me, Jesus, for my lack of faith. You know, so if he's like, ah, I'm Jesus, and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, the conversation wouldn't have been the same. But because he was masked from them, the conversation is totally different. So there's something about the fact that he remains mysterious... And, and he draws them in. It's something in the fact that he remains a stranger that actually he, he gets, he's more successful in what he's trying to do. So has Jesus sometimes been a stranger in your life that you haven't seen him completely, but you've hung in there? Even in the Eucharist, think about that. When you're at adoration, you're like, are you really there, Jesus? You know, and you, but you're still drawn to that mystery. You're drawn to the Mass. You're drawn to the Eucharist. You're drawn to Scripture. And it's at times when you don't recognize Him that sometimes seems to be the greatest conversation you have. Sometimes the greatest conversations you may have with Jesus might start like this. Jesus, I'm not seeing you right now. And then a great conversation happens. You know, And, and, and I think that's kind of what, what happens here with Jesus. Now, with Jesus, I, this is important that we have his humanity, we have his divinity, and we have his glory. Now, when Jesus says, uh, when Peter says, um, I'll, I'll give two examples here, Peter and uh, Thomas. Remember when Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of of the living God. Remember when he says that in Caesarea Philippi? Mm-hmm. Son of the living God. Flesh and blood okay. has not revealed that to you, Peter. Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. So Christ, that word just means anointed. Okay, Christ is the Greek word for anointed. And the equivalent in Hebrew is Messiah. So for someone to say Jesus is the Messiah, all that means is that he is prophet, priest, and king. That he is the one that was promised. It does not, however, mean that you recognize his divinity. It just means that you recognize him being almost the perfect human ever. The best prophet. Because people were anointed, remember, in the Old Testament, people were anointed as prophets, and people were anointed as priests, and people were anointed as kings. But was anyone ever anointed as all three? No. No. So that means he is the, he's the Messiah, he's the Christ. So when you say the Christ or the Messiah, you're meaning this is the one. But it doesn't mean he's divine. So when Peter says you are the Christ, he's saying you're the perfect human. 
check, I believe it. You're the Messiah. You're the one that was spoken of. But then he says something else. You're the son of the living God. Which that's a declaration of what? Divinity. His divinity. Okay? Let's go to Thomas. What does Thomas say? Puts his hands in his side, puts the fingers in, and he says, My, Lord and my, my God. Lord and my God. Some of you say this at the elevation of the Eucharist. You know, the, the host is elevating, My Lord and my God. What is that? Think about that for a second. Lord is a declaration of what? His humanity, him being the greatest. Like, my Lord, how can I help you? You know, like you would call in the feudal times, my Lord, my lady. Mm -hmm. Lord just means you're my, you're my master. But it's not necessarily a, a, a declaration of his divinity, right? Um, because you can call someone my Lord. Or, you know, that we have an art. So Lord just means humanity, okay? That, that he's the prophet, the priest, and the king. But he says also what? And my God, which is a declaration of his divinity. Does it take any faith to recognize Jesus as Messiah? Does it take faith to recognize him as Christ or Lord? I don't know. No. Because it would be a fact. It, would be it, it was just a fact. He mm -hmm. is, he, you either, it's a, it, yeah, he is the anointed prophet, priest, and king. He is the Lord, okay? Um, so, but what takes faith is to see in this man that not only is he the greatest man ever, but he actually is God, right? Um, and then what is still masked, what is still masked in this and this? What still are they not seeing? They're seeing that his humanity and, and, and the perfection of his humanity, yeah. they're seeing his divinity, but and they're acknowledging it, but they're not seeing what? Yeah, he's emptied himself of his glory. They're still not seeing his glory. So when they're on the shores of Caesarea Philippi and Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, he does all that. That's an amazing statement because he's declaring his divinity without seeing his glory. Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He's declaring his divinity, but not yet seeing his glory. That happens to us all the time. We declare the perfect humanity of Christ through our reason and our perfect, the perfect divinity of Christ through our faith, but do we see his glory? We don't. We don't see his glory. Even in the Eucharist, even in the Eucharist, when we see, the, when we see Jesus in the Eucharist, we are claiming his divinity and we are claiming his humanity, but he is still masked, isn't he? He's still under the veil. The veil hasn't been lifted to expose his glory yet. That's real important. There probably have been times in your life when the veil has been lifted and you have seen his glory. This might be through um, maybe a mystical moment when you maybe saw Christ or heard him speaking to you, even a private revelation. This happens, you know. Um, it may be through a miracle. Where we're just, it's a little like, almost like a little puncture and then light shines through and you see his glory for a moment. But it does his glory stay? No. Why does he take back that glory? Why does he veil your eyes again? So that you can't, won't be overwhelmed, maybe. So you won't be overwhelmed. He doesn't want to manipulate your free will. Mm -hmm. Right? He, he wants you to draw close. Even at Mass, we don't see his glory? His glory is masked um, in, in, under the form of bread and wine. It's truly him. It's truly his divinity, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But we don't say his body, blood, soul, divinity, and glory. His glory won't come until heaven. Now, true, Mass is a participation in the heavenly liturgy, but still under our human eyes. The veil hasn't completely been lifted back yet to, to, be, to see his glory in its magnificence. It's still, as Paul says, still in, in a dimness. And part of the dimness is, uh, is our condition here on earth. Uh, there, are, there are moments of glory, but not a complete lifting and a complete showering of the glory. Um, but we okay. get to live in his glory when we... For all eternity. Uh, if, we, if we make that. <laughs> yep. When. 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 Yeah. And that's, that's, part of, that's part of why we say, you know, I remember I was on a pilgrimage once, a Polish pilgrimage, and there was a brother who was with the Franciscan Friars of Renewal, 
And there was this brother from uh, Atlanta or Georgia or something. He'd always go, glory. <laughs> and he'd, he'd close his eyes and he'd put up his hand, glory. You know, anytime something, anytime something great happens, you know, he would just do that. <laughs> and so we all started doing that, glory. But, you know, you see, like, there's this moment that it just, you see it. Ah, glory. And one of the things we say is praise God or hallelujah, you know, or glory, glory, hallelujah. You know, just, you know, I've seen his glory. But that glory isn't just always shining, you know, it's veiled. So, okay. Um, the method of Christ and his church. So what is Jesus' method here? Uh, this is just a Google search, so I'm not saying it's, it's true, but there is probably a little bit of truth to every Google search. Um, there are 307 times in the Gospels that Jesus asks a question. Some great questions he asks here. I love this. this is my, one of my favorite parts of this Gospel. So what are you guys discussing as you walk along? Huh? Eh? Eh? <laughs> wink, wink. Uh, oh, you haven't heard all the things that are taking place? Well, what sort of things, guys? Hey, yeah, fill me in. You know, he's like undercover boss here. You know, he's, <laughs> so what are you guys talking about, huh? You know, it's just like the little kid tagging along, the little brother, you know, tagging along. What's going on, guys? What are you talking about? Yeah, what you talking about? What you doing? And uh, so 307 times he asks questions. Um, he's asked questions 183 times. Um, who, who? Jesus. Jesus has asked questions 183 times that he has asked. Okay, gotcha. But he actually, Jesus asks the question 307 times. That's pretty amazing, okay? What does that tell us about Jesus' method? So we have a school teacher here. What, why, what happens Socratic when method. it's a Socratic method? So why does a teacher ask questions? What's the appro- what, what is the methodology there? Yeah, to probe for the understanding, to, uh, to help the student to understand you, themselves. Yeah, to lead you through questioning to, to mm-hmm. a place. To guide you, draw, not force you, to draw, uh-huh. to draw it out. It's mysterious, isn't it? You know, so, huh. You know, and it's just that, that, that closer, 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 right? That's Jesus' method. The church uses the same method. The church wants to enter into a dialogue and say... You know, world, have you considered this uh, transgender theory? Do you, do you, do you, have you considered the effect of what that might do for families? Um, you might say something like, yes, okay, so what would happen if um, everyone at this point were, had same-sex attraction and only acted on that? What would happen to our society as a whole? Oh, we wouldn't have children anymore. We would, we would cease to be a society in 100 years. Oh, You know, so the church continues to ask these deep questions about people and family and society. Notice that's kind of what the what the popes do. They throw out these questions. You know, so what do you? Let's follow this through. What if? What if what you're saying is true? Is true? What would that look like? And the popes have taken that method. The bishops have taken that method. The church in general asks questions of humanity, because that's what Jesus did. Um, Jesus also does, he has three things he does here. This is, I love this. Um, he, he, um, this is the kind of the threefold mission of the priest in a parish as well. To be liturgical, to be pastoral, and to be catechetical. Father Wallace, who works with our seminarians, said that a good priest will have all three of these. Um, you have met a lot of priests in your life, and you could already identify, if I gave you a priest, let's just say Father Smith, and you in your mind could think, which, if you had to rank Father Smith, which one would you put? Don't do it. But, but you know, you might, say, you might say, well, Father Smith is so pastoral. I mean, there's just, he's so kind, and so he's always with me and hear confession. So I would say pastoral is one. You know, I'm just throwing this out hypothetically. But each of us knows a priest from a different angle, and some might say, God, that priest is a real jerk. But you might say, oh, no, no, he's very pastoral. Or you may say, well, that priest doesn't know much. But you're like, oh, have you heard his homilies? Yeah, he does. I mean, he's very catechetical. So we have to, sometimes our encounter of a priest, you might not be seeing the whole side of his priesthood. You might just be seeing him from the pulpit. 
you might not have encountered him in confession yet. Right? I think one of the saints said that you should be a lion from the pulpit and a lamb in the confessional. And so the priest has this beautiful mission of Christ to be liturgical, to be pastoral, and to be catechetical. If your priest is having those three things on the radar, then it's going to be a very, very healthy church because then the pastoral, liturgical, and catechetical needs of the people will be taken care of. How does Jesus show that here? should be pretty, pretty evident. How does he show a pastoral first? He actually does it in, uh, he does this first, actually. What does he do? He walks, he walks, walks with, with them. them. He accompanies them on the journey, like Pope Francis has been saying. Accompany them for he three smells, hours. He smells like the uh, He smells the flock. like the flock. He's walking with them. He's asking questions. He's getting dirty with them. He's, he's seeing the same uh, landscape. He's, he's with them. He's pastoral. He's asking questions, right? And then he moves into a teaching. And he actually then, we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second, but I don't want to jump the gun here. But he starts teaching. And does he, is he all, no, he, he actually chastises them as part of the teaching. Uh, you fools. So it's okay when a priest says, you fools. <laughs> or, you know, it's okay when, when, a priest, when a priest or the church says, you shouldn't be doing that. But if they only do that, and they haven't been pastoral and asked questions and walked, that's kind of, it's not all going to fit together. And then finally, what does he do with them? Mass. He sits down with them at table. He has mass. He breaks bread with them. Okay, the breaking bread here is the Eucharist. It's not just a nice little meal. Okay, he, so do you see how Jesus uses this threefold mission? It's the mission of Christ first. And the reason, and the church does it because of what? Because Jesus did it. And Jesus did it on the very first day he rose. So day one of, of the, you know, the church does this now, and the church has been doing this since when? Day one. Why do we do this? Because Christ Jesus did it. That's all we're interested in doing. Doing what Christ did. I love when we're doing assessments for the First Communion kids, and I say, why, you know, I, I ask, what is the Eucharist? And they say, what's the body and blood of Jesus? And then the next question is, well, do we really believe that? Is that just a symbol, or do we really believe that? Oh, no, we really believe that. Why do we believe that? Because Jesus said so. That's what the kids say. That's what I tell my kids. Yeah, I read the... to them out of the Bible, and why do we believe it? <laughs> because Jesus has said so. You know, four words, because Jesus said so. I love when the kids say that. Well, Jesus said so. Oh, okay, well, done. You passed. Go we receive your first communion, you know? <laughs> Why does the church teach and walk with people and worship? Because Jesus did it, you know? Okay, suffering. So this is great. Was it not necessary, this is the catechetical part, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? But notice he's doing it in a question. He's asking them, well, don't you guys think it was necessary for, um, for Christ should suffer to enter into his glory? You know, and, and then he starts to explain to them why suffering is so important. That the road to glory, glory, the road to glory is what? Suffering. Because suffering was what? The punishment that we were given in the garden. The, 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 willing, the willingness to suffer is a willingness to help untie the knot that was done in the garden, right? Um, if you've ever had a really a doozy of a knot, you know, it's really, really tight and really big. It takes longer to undo that knot, and it's very frustrating. <laughs> you might even cuss a few times. You know, it's very tough. What makes it really tough is if you're working on a knot on this end, and it's a string, and you look down, your kids are tying a knot. What? <laughs> you know? That's when you're a Mary undoer of knot. <laughs> That's right. But, but you know, what, what's happening is suffering. Suffering is one of those conditions that has been given. 
How did Jesus undo the knot of Adam and Eve? By suffering. How, and we are invited into that suffering. Suffering is not a curse in a sense, of course, in the sense that it's a punishment, it's a curse, but, but it's also a blessing in which we can participate in Jesus in the undoing of knots. We've seen this in our own life. And let's just, let's do away with original sin for a second and just think about your own personal sin, what we call actual sin. The, the knot that you tied, not Adam and Eve. Have you tied knots in your life by sin? Yes. Have you had to suffer because of those sins and through the suffering undid the knot? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And came out better on the and other And came way. out straight and narrow, mm-hmm. on the straight and narrow. Just like John the Baptist says, I have, I have came to make all things straight, right? You know, to, make to straight, straight, the path make the straight the path, straight the stream. So suffering is necessary, um, and we suffer with Christ. Um, the, the most important time this happens is in connection with the Mass, the sense of oblation, the offering. I will suffer with you, Lord, to undo the knots of my own personal sin and any other sin that's out there. Your call on that. Um, it's the role of redemption. Okay, number five, the magisterium. Where do we see the importance of the magisterium? The magisterium is the teaching authority of the church. Um, and it's the teaching authority of the church, particularly to interpret scripture. So where do we see that in this scripture, in this gospel? We see Jesus actually unpacking the scripture. Then, yep, then beginning with Moses... Now, what he, beginning with Moses, Moses, you may not know this, but Moses wrote the first five books. Okay, Moses, uh, the, 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 the Torah or the Pentateuch, yeah. Pentateuch. So the first five books, Genesis was not written by Adam. <laughs> <laughs> or Noah or Abraham. Uh, what, what happened is as, as they finally got their freedom, this makes sense. Um, as you finally get your freedom from Egypt and you start to identify your nation, what's the first thing you must do? Teach your children, right? So, uh, so, so what do you, what do you, if you're going to teach your children, you need to start writing these things down. Lesson plan. And so lesson one is <laughs> creation, right? And then the flood. And then it's, it's, it's interesting because the way that Moses would have taught the first Israelite children is the same thing we do in our CCD programs. We start with these stories of the Old Testament to walk them through salvation history. So we're not doing anything different than the Israelites as they were walking into the promised land. We're still teaching our children the same way. And, and we're doing it according to Moses, who wrote the curriculum. Um, Genesis, Exodus, and, and, and on. So he starts with Moses. So Jesus starts with Moses. And then all the prophets... Okay, so this would have been, of course, you know, the major prophets, you know, Isaiah and, and so on. And he walks through. He does like a Bible study. It's kind of like uh, Jeff Caven's uh, Bible timeline, but in three hours. <laughs> so. Now, is this the point where we basically have a split between the Jewish religion and the Catholic religion? Being that at this point, he goes back and talks about Moses and the prophets and interprets them talking about he had to come and suffer and die. So yes. he says at this point, all he, the way back there, this yes, is what I was talking exactly. about. Exactly. This but is perfect. The Jewish yep. religion Do not, they don't get the connection. So yeah. they, they, got, they don't have any. Yeah, now the, it is important to note that um, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all of scriptures. The right. scriptures here he's talking about are only the Old Testament because so of course the New Testament... It's just the Old Testament. So what he's doing here is he's showing them this in the Old Testament pointed to me. This in the Old Testament pointed to me. This in the Old Testament pointed to me. I am the Messiah. Not only am I the Messiah, but I am God. Do you get it? Check, you're Christian. No, I don't believe. You're Jewish. Yeah, you, you missed it. So you didn't get it. the first lesson. It is. After. And it's, it's where we get the idea of typology. In the church, typology is exactly this. Showing everything in the Old Testament that refers to him. Uh, Passover, the new lamb, he's the lamb that's slain. It's now, kind of the... When Jesus was walking the earth before he was crucified, 
he was talking to us about things, but was he interpreting, he wasn't exactly interpreting the old... He, um, the he was, he was, but everything, of course, the story wasn't complete yet. Right. In this case, he's already died and risen, so he can be a little bit more, he can kind of show yeah. the entirety yeah, of it. Well, because remember, whenever yeah. they handed him the scroll in the synagogue, he unrolled it to Isaiah, and he said, your hearing of this, yeah. you, it's fulfilled in your hearing. And then I am at John 6, he says, <laughs> you, you heard in the Old Testament, you know, or... You, you heard, heard in, in the scriptures that the, the they ate the manna and they died. Well, I am. The, so he's he's been doing this, but just not to this extent. Now he shows all of it, the whole picture. It's like his own biography. Yes. He's, he's just showing. It, I mean, it would have been amazing. Like if you could just put yourself, it's hard to say, if you could put yourself in a time frame in the gospel and you could only pick one gospel to be there. This would be one of the ones I would be really interested in. If I could have been there those three hours and just heard that. Now, they did hear that. These disciples did hear that. Those disciples then did what? They told the apostles right everything. Back, yeah. So when they came back, we're going to talk about that in just a second, the proclamation. Um, when they came back, what were they telling the apostles? Everything that Jesus just taught them. So in a sense, everything we do know comes from this conversation. Yeah. So all these wonderful things that the church fathers have passed on to us, where did they get that? Well, they got that from these two disciples. So, I mean, Jesus did teach the apostles. Not all of that was written down. We know the conversation happened because that's written down, but we don't know the details of the conversation. But actually we do because they've been passed down to us. It's the what we've taught our children, you know, and it's what's been taught to us. It's what's in the J Jeff Cavins Bible studies, you know. This stuff's not new. It started on day one. So, okay, so that's the, so he interprets the scripture. What happens if he just says, hey, so what do you guys think that means? And they're like, oh, oh good, that's a good job, you know. He doesn't say, what's your opinion on this? He actually begins to interpret it for them. That's why in the Catholic Church, we do have an official interpretation an official teaching. Is there room for theological speculation and ideas? Absolutely. But never that can contradict the official interpretation. One example of official interpretation of the scripture is that when we see breaking of bread, that has been for 2,000 years taught as the Eucharist. You couldn't just say, well, that's not what I think it means. I think it means they just broke bread and had a meal. Well, you can think that all you want, but the official interpretation that's been passed down to us by the teaching authority of the church is this. You know, so there are a lot of realms of those things, and it's good for us in a Bible study like that to identify those things, but then there are also things that are kind of left outside of the realm of interpretation because we just don't know. And we can't say something that's not there, right? Um, okay. For instance, there's lots of speculation on uh, it does say who one of these disciples is, right? Mm -hmm. One of them named Clopas. So there's a lot of speculation on who the other one is. Um, but I think that's, that's something, for instance, that's open for theological discussion. I think one even says that, that it was Clopas' wife. So it was a man and a woman that were walking. I, I, really, honestly, does it really matter? It was two disciples. So that's not a matter of official interpretation, because it doesn't officially say it, okay? Things like that. Okay, hospitality. We, we talked about this earlier. Um, and this is coming from Bishop Olson when he, did the, when he did the homily on this. If they would have known it was Jesus, they would have asked him to stay. They don't know it's Jesus. They're walking with a stranger, and they welcome the stranger. Okay, so he... He actually gives an indication that he's going further, and they extend hospitality to him. And the assumption is, you know, just like in our culture, if you invite someone to lunch, the assumption is what? Who's paying? The person that made the invitation. So actually, the assumption, I don't know what their culture was like, but I'm assuming that since they asked him to stay, what are they going to do? They're going to take care of him. They're going to put up the lodging if he needs to stay. They're going to provide the meal. But who ends up really providing the meal? Jesus. Jesus does, and he provides himself. 
So I think that's a, if we're hospitable to Jesus, who in the end is always going to give more? Jesus. But this is a really big, it goes into our care for the poor and our, and our, our primacy of the poor, the saying that, that our preference, I guess, for the poor is that when we see the stranger, we welcome them as Christ. Um, it's a very, very important um, part of our, our teaching in our church. And, and this is key. And they are richly rewarded for their hospitality. Um, you know, what does it say? Jesus can never be outdone in mercy and, and, and uh, grace because if we open up to him in generosity, he'll be more generous to us. Um, okay. The format for the Eucharist, or I'm sorry, yeah, the format for the Eucharist. This is important. I think I spoke about it two weeks ago. But he, he takes bread. Well, actually, you could even say he goes to table with them. But the main format here is that he took, right? And he said the blessing. Took, blessed, broke, and gave. Okay? Part of the blessing here is the thanks. This is the format of Mass. We see this. It's, it's very important that, that, we, that we understand this template or that formula is what we see in the feeding of the 5,000, right? It's what we, a year before the Passover. It's what we see, see at the Last Supper. It's what we see here, the first Mass after the resurrection. And it's what we see in Paul, that St. Paul says, I hand on to you what has been handed on to me, that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave and you hear that every time you go to Mass. You have to hear that every time you go to Mass because that's the words of consecration. If you don't hear that, something's wrong. And you say, Father, that wasn't a Mass. You know, that you're going to hear those words because that's the words of consecration. It's all the way back to what? Day one. We've been doing Mass since day one. And why do we do it? Because, because Jesus yeah, did good. it. <laughs> Yay! We got our Catholic faith. Yeah. <laughs> he took it, blessed it, broke it, gave it. All right, this is the Mass. Um, speaking of the Mass, there are two parts of the Mass. And I'll never forget, I, I hope I don't forget this. Uh, we were on pilgrimage uh, and, and going to World Youth Day in Germany in 2005, and we stayed in Poland for a week, and we stayed at a seminary. It was awesome. We got to stay, uh, the seminarians were all gone, and so we got to raid their seminary and stay in their in their beds and everything it was really cool and uh, their chapel was pretty awesome they they had this i'll just kind of use the board here as an example they had this um like the altar was here and they had this art piece it was like a wall that kind of curled like this something like that and the altar was here but you could walk behind it was the sacristy and this wall was kind of protruding out, and then you had the pews. So we were out here. And what happened is on this, it became a mural of Emmaus. So, like, it had the, the walk, Jesus walking with them, and then it had the ambo here, and then it came all the way around the mural to where the altar was. And what they were trying to show is the two parts of the Mass. What's the first part? What does he do first? He, he breaks... The word breaks open the word, and he starts to explain to them where he's at in Scripture, the, the liturgy of the word, right? And then he what? Then he does the then he breaks bread, breaks the bread, the liturgy of the Eucharist. So this gospel has the Mass in it, the two parts of the Mass, the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And I love that, that little chapel in the seminary because... Yeah. It's like you were in Emmaus. It's like you were in this, this story. And you're just like, well, I'm in the story, and I'm at Mass, and I'm in a seminary in Poland. Okay, this is awesome. You know? <laughs> so um, I do have to say a story about just a really funny story. One of the friars was with us, and I was part of my job on the pilgrimage was to lead all the music. And uh, we had Sebastian at that time was, I think, two years old maybe. So I was a little distracted at Mass because we always had this two-year-old around and um, so I'm up in the choir loft, and Mass is about to start, and uh, Father John Anthony, you probably know Father John Anthony from the mission. So I'm distracted up there, and, and he's ready to go, and 
he like looks at me from you know, I'm in the choir loft, so he kind of looks over his shoulder after me, and, and I'm like scrambling. Oh, I got to get the opening song, and um, and uh, what's the? Oh yeah, I know what I said. So I so I pull, I open it up. It was I was actually using shorter Christian prayer, and as you know, there's not too many hymns in shorter Christian yeah. prayer that we actually know. Right. So I I flipped the I flipped to the only one that I flipped to the only one we know, because all the pilgrims have shorter Christian prayer, and I say. Open up to such and such, and then I go, day is done, and, na, 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 na. and he's processing in to day is done, and then, the only problem is it's nine in the morning, and so he gets to the altar, and he's like, <laughs> he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sleep deprived, I'm a two-year-old, I, my day is done, you know, <laughs> so anyways. It's it, all these, yeah, all these memories. But uh, anyways, we do the best we can do, right? Yeah. As 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 Father John Anthony says, sometimes do your lousy best. <laughs> We're just doing our lousy best. So and then nine, the the mission. Um, at, if you look towards the the bottom, they realize they realize this. With that, their eyes were open. So he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it, and then their eyes were open. At that moment, they recognize him. It's not in, it's in the Eucharist, actually, that they recognize him. But he vanishes from their sight. And that's awesome. We could stop there, and that would be just that's like, still whoa. Be awesome. yeah, but but we, then, they then they said to each other, they start reflecting on this. And it's very important for us to reflect on the Eucharist. That's why adoration is so important, because it, we, we need to let the, the love of Jesus in the Eucharist linger and just stay a little bit longer. That's why we have time of thanksgiving. That's why we stay in the church for a time of thanksgiving. Um, then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened up scripture to us? And so what do they do? The, it's late at night, and they decide to do what? Walk. Back. There's and, no, and there's, and that's, and there's that's no gonna, street there's, lights. There's either. no street lights. No there's, there's, probably, uh, there's probably thieves on the road. It's probably wild animals. Whatever there is. You know, they decide. They've had a long day. They, 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 they could easily have taken probably the option that I would and say, well, that was a great day. Let's, let's get some rest, you know. They have some scotch here at the bar, I'm sure. And, uh, and we'll, we'll just uh, have a nice cup of scotch and go to bed. And, you know, what a great day. I'm looking so forward to tomorrow morning waking up and going back to Jerusalem. You know, that'd be nice to, to see those old guys again and just have a good conversation on what happened today. That's what I would do. Well, I really deserve a nice sleep because that was a long walk and I, that was a lot. My head is just like really exploring right now with all the stuff he said to us. Oh, and he's vanished anyways. Let's just stay. That's not what they do. You know, they say, they say they, they set out at once. No excuses. No stipulations, no concern. They're, they're just like, with what we have just been given, namely for us, the Mass, I have just been given the Word, I have just been given the Eucharist, I have to set out at once. Ite misa es, right? Go, you are dismissed. Go out into the world um, and do it at once. Go back to your families and, and tell them what you've heard. Go into Kroger and tell them what you've heard. Go back into your life and tell them what has happened. Go at once. And so they set out at once to return. And what do they do? They find gathered there the 11 and those that were saying the Lord is truly risen. And, and so that zeal, that missionary call to say no excuses, right? I have to share what I have found and I have to do it now. I can't wait. Um, and, and so then it leads to that. That leads them to their proclamation. And this is a beautiful testimony. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the primary proclamation of the faith. What are they sharing? They're sharing the scripture. They're sharing what he shared with them. That's what we do as Catholics. We share what has been shared with us. We share the scriptures, and then we share how we 
recognize Him and how we have come to recognize Him in the sacraments, in our life, this becomes the primary proclamation. And that's what these two disciples are doing. The same thing that we're called to do. Now, they're really richly rewarded for their obedience. Because what happens in the next verse is Jesus shows up again. So it's pretty cool if you think about it. They were just in Emmaus, seven miles away. They down, broke bread. Downcast, downcast. Downcast. He yeah. vanished. They head back to Jerusalem. He didn't tell them to go to Jerusalem, as far as we know. They just go back to Jerusalem. They know what to do. Now, remember we said earlier they were going away from the church? Yes. Now, through this experience of Scripture and the sacraments, they have now what? Come, come back, back to the church. To the church. And that's how people will come back to the church, is through our loving zeal and proclamation. It may take a long time. It may take a very, 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 very long time. It may, it may take not three hours, but uh, 30 years. But, but eventually, through we can't, we can't stray through the sharing of Scripture and through the sharing of the sacraments, through the sharing of Scripture and the sharing of the sacraments, which ultimately the Mass, the Mass will bring people back to the church. Um, I, I, I work with very many, many, many people that want to become Catholic, and, and I would say most of them actually go to Mass. They're so curious, they want to go to Mass. We're very blessed to have a beautiful Mass here. Um, very, very blessed to have a beautiful Mass a very welcoming congregation, um, very reverent priests, and, and um, this is drawing people back to Jerusalem, back to the church, back to the apostolic church. It really is. And for many of us, it's what's drawn us back. Um, and so we have to remember that. And so they're coming back. Um, they're rich, richly rewarded because then what happens? Jesus shows up. Boom. He had just vanished, and now he's there again. And this is when he gives them some instruction about staying in Jerusalem until, um, until the power from on high uh, comes, which is Pentecost. And so you can read on, but, but uh, that's, that's really what happens. So this is the Emmaus top ten, but it's, it's really so much of our Catholic faith. Wow. Yeah. And the important part of it is that um, to show people that what we're doing now, we have done since day one. And we do it because Jesus did it. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Um, we're just trying to keep the wheel rolling, really. Um, and that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're about, is doing, continuing what Jesus did. So, all right. Well, let's uh, stand and pray, please. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.